The final thing sitting on thin ice is the notion that alternatives to coal are too expensive, that they involve taking the back of the axe to the Australian economy, as the new climate change minister puts it. All the official analysis imagines continued expansion of coal exports, perhaps because so many vested interests don't want to know the answer not one federal or state agency in Australia has yet modelled the impacts of a wholesale shift to renewables from coal in a 10 to 20 year time frame. But when you start doing the sums, you get some pretty surprising results. I was a bit bored one afternoon recently, so I tallied up the cost of replacing nearly 30 gigawatts of existing coal-fired power uh, in Australia with 115 gigawatts of renewables. Factoring in energy efficiency improvements along the way and some backup from gas, that's roughly what you would need to meet projected demand and to uh, turn half of the car fleet into plug-in electric vehicles. Based on estimates from the Clean Energy Council, the overall cost of that was around $316 billion. And that sounds like a pretty big number until you, st until you start comparing it with the alternative. At the moment, we're spending around $9 billion a year subsidising fossil fuel use, mostly through the tax system. And under the CPRS, we would have been spending another, potentially another $6 billion annually, giving the biggest polluting industries in Australia free permits. On top of that, meeting our, po our post-Kyoto emission targets by importing carbon credits from abroad could cost between $7 and $18 billion a year which is roughly like buying a Sydney Harbour Bridge, a Sydney Opera House and a Snowy Hydro scheme every single year. And it's hard not to wonder whether for that scale of investment we might do something of more enduring national benefit than sandbagging the coal industry. Once you start reallocating that money towards renewables, it soon becomes apparent that a shift away from coal is well and truly doable. Going 50-50 with the private sector for example, there is, more than an, there is more than enough to offset the cost of replacing all coal-fired power with renewables and the royalties and taxes generated by coal and coal-dependent industries. And it's also almost certainly a cheaper option for government than the alternatives proposed thus far. When you do the sums, it's hard not to conclude that Australia could exit coal altogether over the next decade or so and come through with flying colours, mostly green and black. The impact on coal and coal-dependent industries would result in a GDP perhaps $100 billion lower or so in 2020 than would otherwise be the case. But that's still a GDP one-third bigger than today. So rather than our economy doubling in size by, in, by 2034, it might take until 2037. Our export basket would suffer in the short term without coal but that, cha that change would take some of the heat our, out of our rising exchange rate, which would fall, and as it did, would help make other industries more competitive, like tourism, manufacturing, agriculture, etc. And what's more, we'd be saving potentially tens of billions of dollars a year on, the, on imported oil, especially as the oil price rises. On the rare occasion this sort of economic heresy is raised, some of the country's best-known commentators will qu quietly accept it. As former chief economist of the ANZ Bank, Saul Eslake, for example, last year acknowledged, while phasing out coal won't be painless, it might be manageable, he said, and would have environmental benefits that are not normally measured in GDP, which could make it worthwhile. Of course, there is no guarantee that the official future will crumble any time soon, even as it becomes clear that clean coal won't fix the CO2 we export in coal, even as people start to realise that alternatives to coal are affordable. No one should underestimate the power of our carbon lobby and the extent to which political inertia favours their interests. No one should take clean energy revolution as a given either. With coal production on track to grow by half in the next 15 to 20 years, it's hard to make the case that this is an empire in decline. That said, there are signs of imperial hubris a sense of invincibility within the industry, a belief that it is simply too big to fail. Coal look, big coal looks permanent, much as the Iron Curtain once did. If anything, the faith that Britannia would forever rule the waves is much less widespread than the acceptance that coal will dominate the world energy market. But as those examples and many others show, betting on the official future can be a dangerous gamble. Right now, like the coal industry itself, 
Queensland is betting big on coal, being too big to fail, and acting as if the best way to prevent coal's demise is by making it much, much bigger. It is as if the state has decided that in the unlikely event that it loses its bet on coal, it's determined to lose huge. With each extra tonne of coal Queensland adds to its pile, the cost of being wrong gets bigger. More taxpayer money being spent on coal infrastructure, more communities becoming addicted to coal, more families tying their own future to coal's future. And the danger for those who imagine that coal's future is guaranteed is that climate change is, in fact, the great moral challenge of our generation, as one ex-Prime Minister famously put it before squandering his chance to do something worthwhile about it. Australians may come to realise that we can and must kick the coal habit sooner rather than later. They may come to think it unconscionable to double CO2 exports over the next decade. They may start demanding that their governments think less about the best bet and more about the right thing. If that starts to occur, movement is likely to be radical and swift, as is usually the case when official futures are trashed. The unthinkable would become routine in this case, Closed coal mines, disused railways and ports, unhappy shareholders, lawsuits, lots of what economists euphemistically call structural adjustment, and lots of coal left in the ground. The bigger Queensland gam Queensland's gamble in the next few years, the greater the economic and social liabilities, should that bet backfire. The great shame, of course, is that Queensland even sees such a gamble as necessary. The Saudis are looking beyond oil a commodity nine times as important to their economy as coal is to Queensland's. Yet life beyond coal here seems unimaginable. As a result, Queensland is missing its opportunity to play a starring role in a transition to a cleaner, greener economy. By calling a halt to the coal rush, by setting a timetable to phase down coal use where the emissions are not captured and stored, the billions of dollars we currently spend exporting, uh, expanding coal production could also pay for just the sort of investment in renewable energy you might expect from a solar state. If we went 50-50 with the private sector, for example, the money Queensland's currently spending on coal infrastructure could phase out nearly half of its coal-fired power stations instead. The truth is, Queensland could be digging out of carbon addiction rather than digging deeper into it. It could, be, it could become the solar state if it was serious about being climate smart. The millions of Queenslanders trying to, do their own, to cut their own emissions in good faith could also be having a real impact as well. But that can only happen once Queensland decides to respond to climate change by cutting emissions rather than increasing spin. Thanks very much. <laughs>